Today I'm going to be sharing my thoughts with you on how to write a research proposal. Hi everyone, welcome to another video. As you can see, I'm sitting outside. Thought I would enjoy the summer year and uh, share some thoughts with you on how to write a research proposal. So maybe you've just started your research now and you have been asked to write a research proposal but you don't know what it is and what, what it entails. The first thing that I would advise you is to find out exactly what the department where you are doing the study at requires with regards to the proposal. Uh, that applies to the technical aspects, the structure itself, its length. So before you write uh, the proposal, make sure that you know exactly what they want. You don't want to be writing something and then only to find out as you are about to submit it that it doesn't comply to the standards and requirements set by the respective department. Typically, a research proposal has six sections. The introduction and background, the problem statement, the objectives, the preliminary... Not again. One hour later. So a typical research proposal has got six sections. The first section, the introduction and background, followed by the problem statement, the objectives, the preliminary literature review. Okay, good. You can go on. Please stop mowing the lawn. I'm trying to film you. So a typical research proposal has got six sections. Your introduction and background, your problem statement, your objectives or research questions, followed by the preliminary literature review. You've got your methods section, and then finally your conclusion. So the important thing with regards to a research proposal is that it is not the final study. You are proposing what you want to do. Will you marry me? So you must indicate to your, your supervisor or the department or maybe the the masters or PhD panel or committee that will approve the proposal that you have done enough reading on the topic that you are comfortable with what you want to do, why you want to do it and why it's important. So the introduction and background sets the scene for the reader, for your supervisor or the committee and it introduces the reader to this world that your study will focus on. So this introduction provides a very important background context. The way you write it is crucial because it leads straight into the, the next section, which is your problem statement. So once you get to the problem statement, it doesn't help you dealing with topics or ideas that you haven't 
introduced in the background. For example, if you liken it to a movie, the first part of the movie introduces you to the characters. I was over in the North Tower the other day. Hi, I'm Tom. It sort of sets the context and then it leads to some problem or some challenge that the main actors need to solve or address or, or have to sit with. So without a good background, it doesn't set the tone for what is to come. Don't spend too little time on the background because it's the first thing that the reader, that your supervisor will read. Once you get to the problem statement, I don't think I'm filming outside again. Six hours later. Now the problem statement is what problem is your study going to address? I have a video up here or up here or down here somewhere on the screen. Oh no, I've gone cross-eyed. There's a link to a, a video on the problem statement. I'll go into detail as to how you should develop it. The two important parts of any problem statement if you don't have a clear problem statement, then there's no rationale as to why this study needs to be done. So the introduction and background and the problem statement in many ways can be seen as one part because you introduce the players and then you get to the problem amongst or between these players, between these schools of thoughts. You can't have a substantial problem if you haven't introduced the background thinking that leads up to this problem. There are two important parts to a problem. Firstly, what the problem is, the obvious problem that naturally evolves from your introduction and background. And then secondly, what are the implications of not addressing the problem? So it's not only a case of telling me what the problem is, but you've got to highlight the severity and the implications of not dealing with this problem. You don't want to be in a situation where after the reader or the supervisor or the research committee that approves the proposal reads your problem, they think to themselves, but who cares? So nobody cares. Why is this important? It's not significant enough. Why are you going to be spending the next two, three, maybe five years for a PhD on this study with a problem that seemingly is negligible or irrelevant or not important? So once you've dealt with the problem, you've got to identify the objectives that will potentially solve the problem or address the problem or shed some light on the problem. Now, many supervisors or departments or universities like having research questions along with the objectives. Me personally, I think the research questions do tend to be a repetition of what the objectives are. Uh, once again, speak to your supervisor, speak to your, the, the, the people in the department of the university where you're studying. They might have predefined requirements with regards to the objectives or the research questions. If you do want to use research questions, in my view, what I would normally tell my students is they follow the literature of you. Because in the literature, you would be arguing the debates, you'd be referring to the thinking and following each respective gap or problem that you identify from the existing literature, you would then specify a research question which then addresses that particular gap. But for me personally, for a research proposal, I think objectives are more than sufficient. You have your one main objective or your main aim or your primary objective and then several secondary objectives. So these secondary objectives, if they are achieved, they should ultimately then answer or address your primary objective. That's the thinking behind your objectives. It then we get to a very important part of your research proposal, the preliminary literature review. In this section, you need to indicate that you have done enough reading on the topic that although you are not a master or a specialist on it yet, that you have shown your supervisor as my professor used to say, that you've gotten your hands dirty. Wax on, wax off. That you've dealt with the theories, that you've dealt with the arguments, the debates, and that you are representing a piece of work in the preliminary literature review that indicates that you understand or have a good grasp 
or what the issues are, or what the debates are, or what the thinking is. It's very important to understand that, as I mentioned earlier, the research proposal is not the final document. So your supervisor or the committee that approves the study are not necessarily looking for an elaborate or extensive review of the literature. Once again, you must be guided by the rules and the requirements or the guidelines set out by the respective department that you are doing this study in. But what I want to say is that I can always see if a student has read enough and it is evident in the preliminary literature review section. So make sure that you read enough. Take enough time before the proposal. I normally tell my students when they start engaging with me at the beginning of their studies, I tell them I don't want to see them for at least three, four months. The first draft only comes after there is enough reading on the topic. Now, once again, what does enough mean? Well, it's enough to indicate that you have gotten a good grasp on the main ideas, on the main thinking, on the main theories. A good tip that I always give my students with regards to the literature review or the reading part leading up to writing the literature review is that once you start identifying authors that keep popping up, their names, after you read a few papers, you see that, that author again, you see that paper again. That could be an indication that you are getting towards some sort of saturation point in terms of that particular uh, bit of research or line of thinking or debate. I've had enough. So that's something to use that I often find is quite useful. So importantly, with your literature, you must indicate what the existing thinking is, but then you also need to show where your study fits in in terms of the theoretical framework. What theories are you going to be using that you are going to be modifying or that, that fits into the way that you are thinking? Because if there's no theoretical framework, the question is, are you making any contribution to the existing thought? So make sure that not only is it a case of identifying the existing schools of thought, the existing thinking, but it's also about seeing where your study fits in and where your study potentially makes a contribution. And then, of course, ultimately, this contribution is about filling a gap which must relate again to your objectives in the study. Now, normally, in terms of your objectives, you would have both theoretical as well as empirical-based objectives. So on the back of your literature review or your preliminary literature review, you should identify certain gaps which you would then use as potential secondary objectives in your objective section. The next section is your methods or research methodology section. Yeah, you're going to tell the reader how you're going to do the study, with who you're going to do the study, when you're going to do the study, and where you're going to do the study. Tell me how. Tell me how. So the methods section is about how you are going to achieve the objectives of your study. Your literature review tells us what the existing thinking is, what the existing situation is. Your methods section tells us how you will set out to achieve what you intend to achieve through your study, how you'll do it, where you'll do it, etc. So is it going to be a quantitative study where you're going to be doing a survey using questionnaires? Will it be a qualitative study where you're going to be doing focus groups or, or interviews? These are the questions you answer in your methodology section. So in terms of specific topics you're going to be dealing with, your sampling design, your data collection design, your questionnaire design, if it's a quantitative study, how you develop the questionnaire. If it's a qualitative study, what does your interview guide look like? And of course, all of this is informed by your literature. So it doesn't help you having a method section and telling the reader or the panel how you're going to do this if there is no logical flow from the gaps you identified in the literature. What I normally recommend to all my students is that once you've finished your methodology section, your method section, provide some sort of diagram. Do I have to draw you a diagram? That shows the flow of how you're going to do it, when you're going to do it, where you're going to do it, uh, at what stage within the study you're going to be doing it, etc. This provides a very nice overview 
for the reader that will help them understand and also see that you understand what you intend doing. Finally, you would have the conclusion which summarizes the whole proposal. Now, I just want to stress again, the purpose of the proposal is not to have the final product. However, you must show your supervisor or the panel that you have done enough reading so that they are convinced that they can send you on your merry way on your merry way then to complete the study. The purpose of approving the proposal or the purpose of the proposal for that matter is to limit or reduce the problems that you could have later on in the study. Remember you've got professors, you've got a panel full of specialists in these fields, they've done their research, they know what pitfalls there are going forward. If you can't convince them that you've done enough groundwork, that you've made your hands dirty enough in the beginning phase, that they feel comfortable that they can let you carry on, they won't approve it. I hope this video helped. I have several other videos that can help you in your research. Have a look at them and I will then see you next time.